in Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for how far you have led us in this Congress. Thank you for the ministration you have given us through your young ministers, the youth choir. Encouraging us not to give up because everything will soon be all right. Therefore, Lord, we're looking up to you that all the courage we need, all the wisdom we need, all the spiritual power we need to be able to continue in the fight against sin, against spiritual wickedness in high places, against the flesh, against false doctrine, against the evil system of this world. We pray, O oh Lord, that you give us everything that is necessary. So we'll fight against evil till the end in Jesus' name. In our various locations where you have called us to serve as missionaries, as leaders over men, leaders over women, leaders among the student world in the northern part of various countries where things are hard and in the midst of religious ideological people and in the cesspool of sin corruption worldliness and evil where you call us to fight against the corrupting systems of the world and to lift up the banner of Christ. Lord, even when the fight seems hard, help us, Lord, that we will not give up in Jesus' name. Even in the midst of false brethren, in the midst of people that they feel that it's their responsibility to attack the true gospel, sound doctrine, the word given from above. And we have to stand right in the middle of the battle to keep on contending for the faith. Once delivered unto the saints, we pray, O Lord, when the youth choir will not be in front of us to minister to us, when our pastors and ministers who are preaching here may not be there, when all these ushers and adult choir and the leaders surrounding encouraging and greeting us and praising the lord with us in fellowship when they may not be there lord we pray in a little corner in a little environment where you called us to keep on on the firing line we pray oh lord we will not give up in jesus name when the battle is long drawn and we are sweating, weary, getting tired, and it appears we say we cannot take another blow, we cannot take another step, and we are feeling that we may not be able to hold on. Oh Lord, remind us that everything will soon be all right. We may have to fight against the lion. We may have to fight against the wild animals. We may have to confront the people that have dark evil power. We may have to stand our ground, walking on the turbulent sea. Lord, we pray that we will always remember it will not be long. Everything will soon be all right. Help us, Lord. To have that anchor in the soul. So that we will never, never, never give up. We've laid our hands on the plow. There is no looking back. So Lord, we pray. You'll keep us till the final day. That when the final time comes. After all the battles are fought, all the messages are preached, all the songs are sung, all the fasting had been concluded, all the winning of souls for us as individuals, 
have come to a climax. When it's about time to see our Lord face to face, when the angels are singing, when the doors, the pier, the pearly gates, when they are opened, when our Lord is standing to welcome us in, Lord, at that time, may we look back and say, Thank you, Lord, I didn't give up. Now, at last, everything is all right. Keep us, Lord. A race to run, a fight to fight. Keep us on. You will do it. You don't want any of us to fall. You will keep us. Thank you for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. This morning we come to our concluding study on Matthew chapter 24. It's like we've been in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. We see him. Already we have answered his question. Who do men say that I am? We have told the Lord in our prayers, in our discussions, that in our various regions and nations and localities where we come from, some people say, you are just a prophet. Some people say, you are just a great teacher. Some people say that you are this or that. But we've gone further to answer the question. When he said, who do you really say that I am? And in our prayers, we have been calling him Lord. We have been telling him that we believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we have also joined the other disciples. It's like we have been sitting down with them on the Mount of Olives. And in our mind's eyes, we could almost see before that temple was destroyed, and we with the other disciples who have been looking in the direction of the temple and were listening intently when the disciples asked the question saying tell us when shall these things be what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world and we've been following jesus christ as he unfolded the things not yet fully understood the things yet to be fulfilled as he had been telling us of the signs of his coming he has told us already that there will be deception because many shall come in christ's name saying i am christ and shall deceive many the lord has also told us not only that there will be deception, there will be dissensions, international disputes. He has told us already, ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Then we have listened to him as he told us, not only that there will be deception and dissensions, there will be devastation. Because then it says, there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. And he told us, these will just be the beginning of birth pains, beginning of sorrows. Then he tells us, there will be destruction of life. For they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and they shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And in the confusion and the turbulence of the time, it tells us there will be deflection from Christ, denial of Christ, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Then it says, He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Then he tells us in the midst of it all, there will be the declaration of the gospel. This gospel, not another gospel. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. 
Then he said, as you see all that going on, there will be the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel. Daniel had the prophecy of the 70 weeks. Actually, 70 sermons. And then the last week, the last seven years, is still to be revealed and fulfilled. Then he said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, when you see that set up, established, stand in the holy place of the temple, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them with me in Judea flee into the mountains. It's telling us that a time of terrible calamity will come. In fact, it tells us in verse 21, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. To this time, no, nor ever shall be. And so Jesus Christ went on. To tell the people the signs of his coming and the signs of his appearance. Then he went on to show the certainty that these things, although there may be people that will think this is unbelievable, incredible. The sun being darkened, the moon not giving her light, the stars falling from the sky powers of heavens being shaken. Many people may say, this looks incredible, impossible, unbelievable. But then Jesus said, in verse 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. All these words are going to be fulfilled. Now we come to the final part and this is always what a good preacher does. A good preacher will begin with an introduction. And you'll see the introduction that we have to these things we've been studying. The setting of the stage. The preamble. The things that ought to come before the various items or parts of the message actually came forth. We see that from verses 1 to 3. Not only that, we've seen part of the major events and details of the message. It's given the signs upon signs upon signs. Now the conclusion. He had to give them a conclusion which will call them to action. You see the message? If it doesn't call you to action... And lead you to a decision. The message will not be well concluded. And as you know the Lord. The Savior. The Master. The Teacher come from heaven. You know that it's going to bring a conclusion. A climax to the presentation. And so in these concluding verses of chapter 24. He talks to us about readiness for Christ's return. Readiness for Christ's return. These words are so full of meaning. Well, you understand that Jesus had an unparalleled ability to use words. His words contained such depth of meaning and wisdom that they often have universal application. His answer to the disciples' question did not only give them knowledge on prophetic events leading to his second coming. The answer also contains a call, an exhortation to alertness, exhortation to readiness, exhortation to faithfulness. These words are applicable to every generation of believers. Look at Mark chapter 13. And you will see that these words in their application are not limited to just a few people or a single generation. That's these concluding words. 
reading from verse 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven. Neither the Son, but the Father. Take heed, take ye heed. Watch and pray. For ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey. Who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work to every man his work to every man everywhere his work and commanded the porter to watch watch ye therefore for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at evening or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping listen to this and what i say unto you i say unto all watch which means that these words we're reading today as we talk about the concluding part of matthew chapter 24 is calling everyone to alertness readiness and faithfulness what i say unto you i say unto all watch our lord's intended message for the disciples and for the church is clear very clear the disciples understood these words as an exhortation to be ready for his coming the church of the first century knew that they were to be ready and the church in every generation is exhorted and counseled to be ready for his coming you see those apostles they were spirit-filled people and they were people that knew the lord they were people that were under the control of the spirit of god and no knowledge they had ever made them careless to think that the Lord could not come at their time. Because the Lord had told them pointedly that no man knew the time, the date, even not the angels of heaven. And so every generation of believers should be at alert, ready, faithful, waiting for the coming of the Lord. And it's the exhortation you find all through the New Testament. Just to remind you of some of these references you know already. Revelation 2.5 Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly. That is, whatever has to be done, do it now. You need to repent, do it now. You need an account to settle. Do it now. I come quickly. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 16. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly. It's still the same message. I am coming. Because I am coming, do everything that needs to be done. Be at alert. Be ready. Be faithful. Chapter 2 of Revelation verse 25. But that which ye have already Hold fast till, here is the, one again, the word again, till I come. He is coming. And as a result of the fact that he is coming, you need to get something done. Have you got any experience? Hold it fast. He is coming. Revelation chapter 3 verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. But don't just hear that I'm coming quickly and be passive and be negligent and do nothing. Hold fast. You see, when you hear the uh, talk or you hear the message of the Lord's coming, it's going to challenge you to take action. In chapter 20, chapter 16, verse 15 of Revelation, behold, I come. That's the word again, I come. I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and see a shame. 
The coming of the Lord is linked with appropriate action on the part of the believer. Chapter 22, verse 20. He which testifies these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Peter, first Peter chapter 4 verse 7 says, But the end of all things is at hand, very near, imminent. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. You will see that you cannot be neutral when you hear a message on the second coming of the Lord. There's something to do. The exhortation, the information you are given that the coming of the Lord is imminent also challenges you at the same time that you need to take action. James chapter 5 verse 8. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. Why? For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also will sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent, shall not proceed, shall not hinder them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. But the end, that's not the end. You've heard about the rapture. You've heard about his coming. What's the challenging word? Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Whenever you talk about the coming of the Lord, you should always be challenging the believers. There is something to do. Every believer must be in a state of preparedness. In readiness every moment of his life. To be careless, negligent, lukewarm, unprepared in our lives is the height of folly and can certainly lead to everlasting shame, sorrow, and suffering. Christ's coming, either at the time of, rap of the rapture, coming for the saints, or at his second coming, coming with the saints, to judge the world will be sudden, will be unannounced. That's why in this concluding part of Matthew chapter 24, he calls us to watchfulness and faithfulness. Matthew chapter 24, verse 42 and verse 44. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come and just in verse 44 he repeats exactly the same thing therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the lord the son of man cometh that's the challenge we are before us in this message and the challenge we have for ourselves in our lives as usual, I'm going to divide these verses 36 to 51 to three parts. Number one, the awful state of the world at Christ's return. The awful state of the world at Christ's return. Number two, watchfulness and preparation for Christ's return return watchfulness and preparation for christ's return number three faithfulness 
of watching servants. Faithfulness of watching servants. Number one, the awful state of the world at Christ's return. Now please understand, there is difference between teaching and preaching. And in these sessions I've been taking with you, you'll see that we're going into the scriptures and we're allowing scripture to interpret itself. We're allowing scriptures to speak out and tell us what we do not know. And here you will find the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Honestly, I'll be more than afraid to twist, to change, to modify, to edit, to add to the words of Jesus Christ. We're talking about the words of Christ that had been with eternity in eternity with the Almighty. We're talking about Christ that knows all things, both what you know and what I don't know. And we're talking about Christ that had eternity future, all stretched in front of him. And he could tell you the details of what you know about time and eternity, past, present, and future. And when you come to the words of Jesus Christ, you come on sacred ground. And you want to see that here are the very words of Jesus Christ. What he said, he said, near at the time when the Son of Man shall come, that this will be the condition and the stage of the world. And you better keep to this word as Christ said them. In Matthew chapter 24, here we are in verse 36. It says to start with, but of that day and hour, knoweth no man. We have to be very sincere. There are people that are trying to speculate. And they are trying to set date. Date for the rapture. Or date for the second coming of Christ. All such speculations are baseless, useless, and unfruitful. Because Jesus Christ himself said, Of that day and hour, knoweth no man. He even said, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And as he said that, he then comes to tell us the state of the world, the condition of the world at the time when Christ will appear. Verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. He didn't leave it like that for you to make your own conclusion, for me to make my own conclusion. He went forward. He said, For as the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Then he concluded, so, in exactly the same way, shall it be, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So you will see then the awful stage of the world at the time of Christ's return. If you turn back to Mark again, where we read before, Mark 13. Mark 13 and verse 32, but of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. It's still telling us that because we do not know that time, we do not know the day, we do not know the year, we do not know the hour, that's the reason we ought to be at alert, fully prepared, knowing that the Lord can come at any time. Then he compared the condition of the world at the time of his coming. He compared that to the time of Noah. And let's understand, you, you see there are people that will tell us that before the Lord comes, he's going to give us chance. 
that actually some people will go as far as saying the Lord cannot come now because all the people in my village are not converted yet they will say the Lord cannot come now all the people in this nation Nigeria had not been converted yet you know all the people in Ghana in your country in wherever you come from they have not all been born again so they will say that because the people had not been born again all of them or the majority of them that that means the Lord cannot come now Jesus Christ himself himself he says no he says at the time of his coming the condition of the world the stage of the world will be like the condition at the time of Noah now that's the Lord himself saying that oh yes he died for the whole of humanity but that same Lord that same Christ that same Savior that same Redeemer that died for the whole of humanity he tells us not the whole of humanity is going to respond and not every one of them is going to yield to the absolute rulership and control of the master the lord and the king before his coming will preach the gospel to every creature but getting saved depends on a number of factors it depends on their yieldedness because jesus christ himself said i would have gathered you like a hen gathers the chicken under her wings but ye would not he said their eyes they have closed their hearts they are sealed that they might hear and not respond that they may not be converted lest i should heal them he came unto his son and his son received him not only to those that received him he gave power to become the sons of god Paul the apostle said the gospel should have been preached to you first but because you judge yourself you count yourself unworthy of the grace of God lo we turn to the Gentiles you see he wants everyone to be saved but not everyone is going to get saved because the Lord is not going to uh, take over your free will to save you you have to yield you have to surrender and you have to say yes lord before he will save you so that's why jesus himself said close to the end of time at the time when christ will come that it will be like the condition of the people of noah's day what was the condition then genesis chapter 6 genesis chapter 6 reading from verse 11 the earth also was corrupt before god and the earth was filled with violence and god looked upon the earth and behold it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth god said unto noah the end of all flesh is come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them and behold i will destroy them from the earth can you see that 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 was a condition in this world at the time of noah when the ark was built and when noah was about to enter into the ark and then jesus christ himself jesus christ himself he said as it was at the time of noah even so it will be at the time when the son of man when christ will return what do we learn from that from the very words of the lord we learn the world will not be converted there will be people who will be converted and the apostles tell us that god chooses he selects he picks up people from among the nations and the tribes the people that come to the lord the people that respond the people that repent the people that will go into the scriptures and still remember without holiness no man shall see the lord those are the people those are the people it's not every deacon harry not everybody that attends a church not every nominal christian not everybody carrying the bible 
Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall get into the kingdom of heaven, but the people that do the will of my Father which is in heaven. Because in fact, in that day, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out devils in your name, and we have done these many wonderful works in your name? Then will I, Christ the Lord, the Master, when then will I profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What does that tell you? That tells you not the whole world will be converted at the time Christ returns. It will be found, the world will be found in the same condition that it was in the day of the flood. When the flood came, men were found absorbed in their worldly pursuit. Worldly pursuit. And utterly disregarded all the repeated warnings of Noah. The majority of people were unconverted and they were unprepared to meet the Lord. And so our Lord says, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes. Let us not be deceived. And let us not deceive ourselves. That all sinners will be converted and the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord before the Lord comes. You know, some of the passages that others may refer to as Habakkuk and all those other passages, the knowledge of the Lord filling the earth as the rivers cover the seas, actually it's referring to the millennium. It's not referring to this present age before the coming of the Lord. Oh yes, at the time of the millennium, when Christ himself will be on this earth physically, and he will rule and he will reign. And then he will choose the saints. You have ruled over five cities, over ten cities, and all those places at that time in the millennium. The knowledge of the Lord will cover the land as the seas cover the ocean. But for now, before the return of the Lord, for now, before the rapture, it is only those who are receiving the Lord that are having the knowledge of the word of God. So we need to understand and balance up things so that we will know that the words of Jesus Christ tell us that the world will be in an awful condition at a time when Christ returns. Of course, you've seen all that yourself. You know other scriptures? You know, if I could give you other scriptures, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, everybody will flood into the faith. No, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Then it says, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of themselves in the last days and covetous and boasters and proud and blasphemers disobedient to parents unthankful unholy then in luke chapter 17 verse 28 we're told likewise also as it was in the days of lord they did eat they drank they bought they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, he trained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Listen to the concluding word of Jesus in Luke chapter 17, verse 30. Even thus, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. That shows you very clearly that the doctrine of worldwide revival that gets everybody saved before Christ's return, that kind of hypothesis is unscriptural. Just before the return of the Lord, the world will be dominated not by faith but by unbelief, not by holiness but by wickedness. Not by godliness, but by ungodliness. The world will be epitomized by secularism and false religion to an immeasurable degree. But for those who want to make it at that time when Christ will come, that's why he calls you and me 
to watchfulness. That leads me to point number two. Watchfulness and preparation for Christ's return. Watchfulness and preparation for Christ's return. In Matthew chapter 24, we're looking at it now from verse 40. Matthew chapter 24, verse 40. Then shall two be in the field. One shall be taken, the other left. It's telling us once again, not everybody will be ready. Not everybody will be qualified to go. One will be, two will be in the field. One taking, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the meal. The one shall be taking, the other left. Watch therefore. Watch therefore. It's not automatic. I'm coming to church. I'm preaching the gospel. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. It's not automatic. I even profess to have been born again. It's not automatic. Watch therefore. For ye know not what hour your Lord does come. But this know, know this. That if the good man of the house had known in what hour, in what watch, that is what time, what period of the night, the thief will come. He would have watched and would not have suffered, permitted his house to be broken up. The conclusion again, watch ye therefore. Therefore be ye ready for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. So you will see what the Lord is telling us. He's calling us to watchfulness. In Matthew chapter 25 verse 13. Watch therefore. For ye know not neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Watch ye therefore. Now, if there were no danger, the Lord will not be repeating it over and over and over again that we should watch. If all those disciples were fully secured, and whether they went into sin or whichever way they lived, it didn't really matter, he would not have told them to watch. But he told them to watch because it was necessary. Because if they didn't watch, the day will come upon them unawares. In Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Reading from verse 34 to 36. And take heed to yourselves. Lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with soft-fitting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that they come upon you unawares. You know, there are even some legitimate things you can be doing in the world. Legitimate, proper, not sinful, but you can be so absorbed in them. You can be so consumed with those things that you will not take care of your spiritual life. And you may have your good reasons for it, and yet the Lord is saying, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness. And then it says, and the cares of this life, cares of getting married, wanting to have children, wanting to excel in your profession in the world, wanting to do this, wanting to do that, until you do not remember that you are like a person waiting for his master, waiting for his Lord, who can come at any time. In verse 35, it says, For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Brothers and sisters, what does that verse tell you? It tells you that the majority of the people of the world will not be ready. Because as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. It says, watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. The Lord is calling us to watchfulness. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 from verse 11. Romans 13, 11. And that knowing the time, 
that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now, is our salvation nearer than when we believed? It's telling you that you, you've gone some length, you've traveled some part of the journey, and the destination is nearer now. The time of the rapture is nearer now. The time of the coming of the Lord is nearer now. And it says, for now, it's our salvation. It's not talking of the salvation of being born again. It's talking of that final, that final um, end or aspect of salvation. When we go to, when we leave this world, we go to be with him. The night is past pain. The day is at hand. And as we see the day being at hand, the time getting near, what are we exhorted to do? Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy. Well, the watch is so very clear that when the Lord appears, there will be no time to repent at that time. There will be no time for a change of mind. Believers shall be caught up to glory, to honor, to life everlasting. Unbelievers will be left behind to suffer agony, wrath, and judgment. Who can imagine the misery of those who will be left behind? May we think seriously on these things and consider our ways. In the days of our Lord's return, there will be a sudden, painful separation. That's what we read. Two shall be in the field, one taken, the other left. And two will be grinding at the meal, one taken, the other left. In the day of the coming of the Lord, there's going to be a sudden, painful separation. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, wives will be separated from husbands. The wives that are ready, the wives that are faithfully following the Lord, living according to the word of the Lord, they will be taking the careless, backsliding, lukewarm husband will be left behind. Parents will be separated from children. Brothers will be separated from sisters, preachers from hearers, the godly from the ungodly. The separation in this passage is also applicable to the time of Christ's coming to judge the world. The tires will be separated from the wheat. The goats will be separated from the sheep. The wicked will be taken for destruction as in the time of the flood when the wicked were taken away and the righteous will be preserved. The Lord is calling you and calling me, saying, seeing that all these things are so, what preparation are you making? What preparation am I making? Just as believers today do not know at what time the Lord is coming to take them to himself in the rapture. The generation that will be alive during the tribulation, they will not know the exact time of Christ appearing to judge the ungodly and to establish his kingdom. The word he has for all of us is to watch. To watch. Watch over your life. Don't be careless. These are very terrible days. And people are backsliding here and there. But you make up your mind. Once again, remember the message from our youth. Don't give up. Everything will soon be alright. It may be that you have to go through some rebuke and persecution and suffering and need. Watch. Be ready. It will not be long. Our Lord will come. Let's go to point number three. Faithfulness of watching servants. Faithfulness of watching servants. Matthew chapter 24. Reading now from verse 45 to 51. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? Whom is Lord has made ruler over his household? 
to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if, that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here Jesus calls all the believers, all the saints and his servants to faithfulness. This call to faithfulness is for believers of all generations. Peter asked to know, in Mark, if these words were applicable to the disciples. And Christ's answer reveals that they are, that is, the words are for everyone. Those who will be ready at Christ's coming must be faithful. We have been given a divine stewardship and responsibility in the work of Christ on earth. And in that stewardship, we are to be faithful. Your life, energy, talent, spiritual gifts, and every other good thing you have are trusts from God to be used in his service and to his glory. The unfaithful servant will be judged with hypocrites and sentenced to an everlasting hell where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Each of us then will need to ponder on the question in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 6. A faithful man who can find to be ready for the Lord's coming, he must find us faithful. As we look at these seven areas where the Lord is calling us to faithfulness, you will need to ask yourself, am I that faithful? In these areas where the scriptures reveal that I must be faithful, number one, you need to be faithful to the Lord who has called and chosen you. We need to be faithful to the Lord who has called and chosen you. That's the first aspect you need to think about. You see, you will already you are ministering in your locality where the Lord has used the church to appoint you, place you there, to support you, to be praying for you. How faithful are you to the Lord in Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Now listen to this. And they that are with him, those who will be with the Lord at that time, are called and chosen and faithful. I expect you to be reading your Bibles. I wonder why some of you are just looking at my face when we're reading Bible passages. This Bible study. So open your Bible and read when I read. It says those who are here who are going to be with the Lord. They are the people, number one, they are called. But remember, many are called but few are chosen. These people who are with the Lord, they move further. More than being called, they are chosen. But that's not the end of each. God said, I have called him to be a minister to the Gentiles, a chosen vessel. But then the third point is this. After you have been called and chosen, you will need to be faithful. And you need to be asking yourself, how faithful are you to the Lord? And if the Lord were to examine the work you are doing, how faithful are you? Have you been? 
I cannot be in all the places, obviously, as a human being. But then we are assuming, taking it for granted, that in the church locations where we are sent to you, you know the teaching of the word of God. And you know the very foundation of this church. And we do not play with that foundation that says follow peace with all men. But not peace at the expense of holiness. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And we don't make any apology for the teaching of holiness that we stand on in this church. And if there is any minister, any evangelist, any pastor, any teacher that feels that his calling is not to call people into holiness, is not to call people and challenge them to live a life above reproach, a life that is clean and righteous and pure and holy, then you have no right staying in deeper life and preaching if you are going to stay with these people here preaching the word you'll be faithful to the lord you will say well this is what we have all seen taught learned in the word of god and keep faithful to it the day it comes in your location where you are that you will say well this is what they say in the deeper life and you still use the name deeper life. But this is actually what I believe. I think you are even acting like a coward. You are not able to stand up and say, I don't believe that holiness stuff. Therefore, have all your documents and all the authorization you have given me. I want to go. I think that will show that you are actually bold for what you think you believe. Rather than you are under the cover of a holiness movement. You are under the cover of people standing on sanctification and a pure life. And then we want to be faithful to the totality of scripture. And there you are standing on deeper life platform. And then you cannot be faithful. Although you are called, although you are chosen, but you are not faithful. But the people that are going to be with the Lord are the people, number one, they are called and chosen and faithful. Doesn't the Bible say that, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And then we're told of Christ, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. Number two, you'll need to be faithful in doctrine. Teaching the truth the New Testament has given to us. You will need to be faithful in doctrine. Now, here is a teaching ministry. And we do not exalt one kind of doctrine above another. The Lord has seen his feet to give us the whole Bible. Not only the Old Testament, not only the New Testament, the old and the new. Like your left hand and your right hand. Like your left leg and your right leg. Like your left ear and your right ear. Like your le left eye and your right eye. You see, God has given us a complete body, having these two parts. And when we come to become servants of God, projecting, proclaiming, promoting the Lord, then it means that you want to make his word to be at the forefront. And you want to be faithful to that word. Not that you will say, well, that's Old Testament. If it's Old Testament, it's there for our learning. These things were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And therefore, I want to challenge every deeper life preacher again. And if you are there, we invited you from your nation, from your uh, congregation. You are not a deeper life, but it's still the same Bible. We're only helping you and telling you that even if you do not go by the name Deep Alive, you need to commit yourself to the word of God that will be faithful in doctrine. You'll be faithful in teaching the totality of truth revealed to us that has been given unto us in Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, reading from verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. Not that he'll hold the word of God with a loose hand. Not that he will be holding the word of God with loose, 
careless conviction, but is holding fast, holding tight to the word of God. And uh, that is one thing I have to thank God for in my own personal life. I've read quite a lot. I've met quite a lot of people too. And I'm invited to various, uh, various places. But thank God. And I've met with some, uh, quite some difficulties too. As I'm invited to this place and that place and that place to preach. And, uh, but I'm used to that. Because you see, I am called to defend the faith. I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't know this when I was very young. Uh, but you know, God himself, uh, sometimes when he has his hand upon your life, he makes a lot of things to be going through even before you know him directly. Uh, because you see, when, uh, when I was very, very young, I wasn't a born again Christian then. I was just in the Anglican church. And in the Anglican church, they have this uh, system of bringing these little infants together. And then they will give them a kind of name. What they call Christian name. And I said, they brought me there and he told me that I was going to be given a Christian name. I said, wonderful. And then they asked me, what name would you want? And there was uh, one man in town, his name uh, was Johnson. And I, li I liked his figure, I liked his attitude, I liked everything about him. I told the officiating priest, I said, I like the name Johnson. And you know what happened? He looked at me. And as he looked at me, uh, he said, all right. And then he made the cross of the sign in their water baptism. And he said, your name will be William. I was disappointed. I didn't like William. I wanted Johnson. And so when I later I became born again, I didn't think of it. I just, you know, this was many, many years ago in the 40s. And um, eventually I became born again studying the bible one day somebody challenged me he said do you know the meaning of this name you are bearing william oh i said i never thought of it he said the original meaning in the book where these names originated it means defender of the faith so i said i didn't i said no wonder that every time that's why we write it at the back here honestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints even before i knew the meaning of the name there was something deep within me i couldn't stand false doctrine couldn't stand error and anywhere i stand i want to just read the bible study the bible teach the bible and be faithful to the word of the lord and by the grace of God, we've been that faithful to the word of the Lord. And, um, you know, in Nigeria here, God has blessed the work. And we've gone into various African countries, as you are all represented here. And God has blessed the work because we decided and determined we were going to keep on defending the faith, being faithful to the word. It's the same thing I'm challenging and calling you to. I pray you will be faithful in Jesus' name holding fast the faithful word as he as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers what did paul tell timothy and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses the same commit thou to what kind of men Faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Number three. Faithful ambassadors of Christ. Reaching the lost while there is hope. The Lord is calling us to be faithful ambassadors of Christ. Reaching the lost while there is hope. In Proverbs chapter 13 verse 17. A wicked messenger falleth into mischief. But a faithful ambassador is health. And you know that we are now ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled unto God. We are ambassadors. And as ambassadors, we must be faithful ambassadors of Christ. When an ambassador goes from one country, uh, from his country, to another country, to represent his country, he doesn't um, 
disrespect his own country, but he'll defend the law of his country. He will stand by his country because he knows that he is representing his country on a foreign land. And if we are ambassadors of Christ, represent Christ where you are and be faithful. And your faithfulness should be very clear, glaring to everyone that will see you. Number four, faithful in our secular employments. Faithful in our secular employments. The thing that we have enjoyed in Nigeria here is uh, the faithfulness of our members in their employment. And uh, those of you that may be coming from other countries, in Nigeria here, especially many, many years ago, when we were, you know, just getting started, we will teach very clearly the word of God. And we will tell the people, you are supposed to resume at 7 30 your place of work, be there on time. And when you get there, you are supposed to sign the register and you are supposed to say, this is the time you got there. If you get there by 8 o'clock, don't write 7 30. Don't tell a lie. Just keep to the truth in your place of work. If they are going to defraud, if they are going to embezzle, if they are going to give bribe, if they are going to do anything that is not according to the truth, according to the light, do not take part in it. That's what we told the people. And we said, if before you became a Christian, or before you became, before you knew the knowledge of the truth, the way you know it now, you have defrauded your company. You have stolen from the bank. You have done a lot of evil things. Go back to those same places, make your restitution, and tell them, this is what I stole. Or some who are working with other people's certificates, we said, go back and tell them. Do you know the result of that? Eventually, the companies in town, the factories in town, and the public uh, houses, they began sending to us, do you have somebody who can be a manager? We need a manager, and it's only deeper life person we want. Another person will arrive from another factory, he'll say, we're looking for a foreman. Can we get a deeper life person? And every Monday at the Bible study, the, 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 the requests, were, they, they were pouring in. And we'll say, well, listen to this announcement. If you're an accountant, uh, they say there's an opening in this place. Uh, they say that if you're a banker, there's opening there. If you're a headmaster of a school and you want to head a school, they say there is appointment there. If you're a secretary, the, the appointment, all those requests were pouring into our church every week because of faithfulness of our members. How is it in your country? And those of us who are from the various states, how is it in your state? You see, this is the thing. And if I, uh, there are some things I cannot tell you because of, uh, you know, this is a large crowd. If I told you some of uh, the places where, uh, you know, big bodies and highly placed uh, corporations and organizations in this country, where they have uh, quietly come to us and they have said, don't you have uh, somebody who can help us in this area? And sometimes, uh, you know, they would have talked to those people uh, directly themselves. I'm talking of big, uh, you know, kind of uh, responsibility that we don't want to talk about in the public. And then some of those officials uh, will talk to me privately and say, uh, why don't you encourage uh, your member, this person? We need him in this area. And we're preaching to him. He has not replied us yet. Uh, why don't you encourage him uh, that he should take up that sensitive position? Why are they troubling us like that? Why are they telling us we should send those people to them? Because they knew that a real, genuine, bona fide, deeper life man will not steal your money. He will not change your account. He will not change the receipt. And if he did anything mistakenly, the following money is going to say, Sir, see what I did mistakenly. See this thing that uh, I didn't really mean it. See what happened. They know that the deeper life people are the people you can put uh, your checkbook in their hands and they will, not, uh, they will not vanish out of town. That's how deeper life has been. Keep it like that. In all your locations, in all your countries, let us be faithful in our secular employment. That's what we learn about Daniel in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 4. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But... They could find none occasion, no fault 
for as much as he was faithful and neither was there any error or fault found in him. Number five, faithful in small matters in kingdom service. Faithful in small matters in kingdom service. Well, uh, when we talk of kingdom service, we talk about everything. Everything. You'll be surprised what happens here in our headquarters church. In our headquarters church here, things are straightened out. And I get involved in everything. Uh, it will be, you know, you might uh, wonder, how does he get involved in all those things? Because I see that I need to be faithful even in small things. Uh, the, the children, the youth people who are singing, uh, before, the, before this uh, time, I asked the youth leader, I said, what songs are they singing? And he showed me the songs. I said, practice, although I don't have time to be with you there, record everything in cassette and let me listen. And so they recorded it in cassette, and I listened, and I said, well, this place needs to be improved, that place needs to be improved, that place needs to be improved, go and do it all over again. And so they did it again, and recorded the second time, incorporating all those, co all those corrections. And then I saw the youth leader, and I said, it's all right now, but let them uh, pick it up and maintain that standard. I get involved with all that. They, sometimes I would even take, uh, you know, music, uh, uh, something, a particular song I wanted. I'll tell, I'll tell the choir master, i say, this one, practice it. I need this one. You see, even in those small matters, I still have to be very faithful and vigilant. It was, you know, when we came to the uh, Congress here, I saw those uh, ushers, those sisters. And I saw that they were wearing a kind of dress that I didn't know anything about. So I kept quiet. I wanted to watch and, and get my facts very well. So I, yesterday, I saw them wearing another thing again that had red color. I said, deeper life. When did they start taking loss into their hands? So I called the head usher and I said, this kind of dress I see, when did it start? He said, I'm sorry, I wanted to see. I said, right now, withdraw all those ushers and send them away from this congregation. I don't want, you know, anything to be done that uh, Ghana will see and copy, that uh, Kenya will see and copy, that Uganda will see and copy, and I didn't know anything about it. And so they withdrew them. And, uh, you know, eventually I saw them reappear this morning and, you know, they had corrected all those things. They didn't get angry. If they got angry, they shouldn't have been a worker under me. But because they know that there is a leader, there is a pastor, and that this pastor is meticulous about small, small, small things, and that I'm going to check up, how is this there? Why is that there? Why is that there? Now, if you're a leader, you cannot be faithful in those small, small things and check up. How are you going to be a leader? And this is a challenge we're giving to everyone, that no matter how busy you are, our state uh, choir, uh, maybe they don't know, but I've been to 24 states uh, this last year. And when I sit there on the platform, I call the choir master. I say, what song are you singing? Go and bring all the manuscripts I want to go through and see how the songs are appropriate with the messages. I will do that even when I go for outside program. If they are singing choruses in one of the states, I was sitting on the platform. They were singing choruses, and I saw that it was going in the other direction. And I said, well, even though it's not too bad yet, if I wait until it becomes strange fire, it will get out of hand. While they were still singing, I went to the uh, person standing on the pulpit. I called him aside, and the people were singing. And here we were in the front. I was talking to him, that kind of chorus. Where did that come from? I about this, I about this. I said, change it, correct it, and then go back to the pulpit, and then uh, the corrections were made. Over here, we look at everything, and we're meticulous about every area and every aspect of ministry because the Lord gave me the vision, and I know how to translate the vision. And if there are people walking with me, preaching with me, praying with me, organizing with me, doing things with me, who do not know how to carry out the details of the vision, I will have to explain it to them. I will not want them to impose human ideas on the divine thing the Lord has given us. That's the challenge I'm giving you. As you go to all the various places you are going to, and you are preparing for the coming of the Lord, be faithful in small matters of the kingdom. Will you? 
In Luke chapter 16, and in verse 10, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye be ye have been unfaithful, ye have, been, have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, material things money, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Number six, be faithful in hard times. Be faithful in hard times. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. But be thou faithful unto, 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 unto death. Well, you may tell the truth and people may frown. That's still not death. You may be faithful in, the, in teaching the word of God and people may withdraw some privileges from you. That's not death. Be faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Number seven, be faithful in feeding the church with the pure, unadulterated word of God. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? Whom his Lord has made ruler over his household. To give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. If we are faithful, then he says, he will make us ruler over all his goods. We are told in Acts chapter 20 verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves. And to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Now the Lord has challenged us in this series of studies. He has told us there are signs preceding his coming. He has told us of the abomination of desolation and of the coming of the Antichrist and the catastrophic dangers that will be in the world at the time of the Great Tribulation. He has also told us that he will definitely come. That when you see all these signs appearing, you know the Lord is near at the door because this generation shall not pass till all those things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Now is calling you and me to alertness, readiness, faithfulness, watchfulness. May the Lord find us watching when he comes. The Lord is coming again. And only the people that are watching are getting ready. Only those people will be able to go when he comes. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. Even as he is pure. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Are you getting ready for the coming of the Lord? Have you heard the warnings of the Lord Jesus Christ? If you are called and chosen, are you faithful? You see the awful condition, the awful state of the world at a time when Christ will come. Don't think he's going to wait till everybody is converted before he comes. He can come anytime. Be ready. Watch and pray.
do not be sucked into the cesspool of the present age of the present world. Maintain your stand for the truth. Your stand for sound doctrine. You are a pastor, you are a preacher, you are an overseer. Take your stand for the world. And be faithful to the Lord who has called you. Don't deviate from the scriptures. Be faithful. Don't change the word. Don't modify the word. Don't go into false doctrine and strange fire. Be faithful. Be faithful. 